There are so many people with private land, you buy private land to manage deer herd. You wanna have a great hunt. There's a lot of people though that really aren't deer managers. And, uh, and I'll bring you over to public land. Obviously this is talking about private land and what you can do on private land, your potential that, that I want you to achieve and that I try to strive for on my own lands that I hunt. But there are a lot of people hunting public land and hunting a certain area and they're accomplishing more on that public land without planting or doing anything to the timber than a lot of people are actually doing on private land. In fact, there's a lot of people on private land that five years later, their land is worse off than it was as it relates to contributing to a healthy deer herd and actually managing a deer herd. And we talk about that all the time. And we'll talk about these. Are you really a herd influencer? I want you to be a herd influencer, but the problem is number one here, there's only about 5% of all deer parcels or less, and this number could be three or 2% that actually attract the daylight focus of non-immature bucks. We're talking middle age to mature bucks, whatever that is in your area. Maybe that potential is a three-year-old buck and uh, in very few properties in the area will actually attract the daylight attention of that three-year-old buck if that's that max age class. Same with if there's five, six, seven-year-old bucks, there's very few that attract it because there's very few that have those ingredients. And if you're not attracting the bulk of the buck herd, you know, the, the older age class included, then you're not really influencing anything. And I, and I wanna point this quote out. This is something I thought of, and maybe it's a repeat of someone else's quote, but it just sticks true to me is, you have to know what you are not in order to know what you can become. And a lot of people think they're a deer manager, but unless you're managing, number two, a daylight herd during the hunting season, you are not managing anything. You might throw a lot of dollars at food plots, timber stand improvement, native vegetation, but just because you're doing that doesn't mean you're a deer manager. That's habitat management. There's a difference. We need to draw a line between that because I want people to know their true potential. A lot of people get into their sixth, seventh year of owning land and they say, well, it's not all about shooting big buck. Folks, if you don't have big bucks to shoot on your land during daylight, during the bulk of the hunting season, you're doing it wrong. And what I mean is not six, seven year old bucks, not eight, there's not an age class, it's the oldest bucks in the neighborhood. So it's all relative. In a Southern Michigan, heavily hunted area, that might be that true age class, might be a three year old buck, maybe an occasional four. Um, I've seen some really over hunted area, small parcels where it was tough to see a two year old, let alone a three year old every year. So really, this is all relative. Uh, you might be in Iowa, you say you're managing deer, but you're shooting great four and five year old bucks and you're never getting a look at those six, seven year old bucks in the area. You're not really managing deer then because you're not doing the best that can be done with the conditions given for your area. Again, daylight herd during the hunt. And a lot of people, unfortunately, the scientific community, community will look at it, well, these mature bucks have a three mile home range, but they do not have a three mile home range during the daylight. And very few people give deer the conditions of habitat and food that lasts the entire season without spooking it to get to experience what can be done with very small micro parcels of 20 acres, 30 acres, 40 acres or more, let alone a couple hundred acres. There's a lot of people out there that have 800 to 1,000 acres and they're not matching anything because of the way they hunt, the way their property's laid out so they can't get in and out without spooking deer. Those deer leave the land, even though it's 800 to 1,000 acres, and, and they if they're leaving the land during the hunting season, you're not managing deer. You have to have deer to manage. And so you don't manage and create a herd from the end of the season the day after to when the season begins, you manage a herd during the season. Think about it this way. Look at it, when, when we have a mature buck that we're after or a, a younger buck that we're hoping to shoot next year, when is the big relief factor for that deer? It's when we get a picture of them after the season ends. Why do we feel relieved? Because the bulk of those deer that make it through the season and we get pictures of them during the winter time, guess what, they live. They're very resilient, they're very tough. Yes, they can get killed by a car, they can succumb to some type of disease or sickness, injury, whatever it might be, but of the vast majority of them make it through because it's the off season. The off season is not when a deer herd is created, that's a given. In fact, the majority of whitetail states, I would say 85 to 90% of all whitetail states, there's not any kind of stress during the summertime, in fact, especially as you go to the north half of all of the country, deer have more than they need during the summertime. You're really not 
changing the health of the herd to any degree. And if you are changing it by a couple percentage points, but then you don't attract and hold those deer during the fall, guess what? Healthy dead bucks don't grow either. So you, even though you have the best intentions of building a great herd, if you do a great job in the off season of providing food, when the local habitat's already a, local, a nine out of 10 or nine and a half, you're making a nine and a half or 10, you're really not making a difference. Differences are made during the hunting season. That's when you actually build the herd. So if you don't have deer focusing on your land during the daylight, which you can, even with small parcels, then you're not a herd influencer and you're not actually managing deer. Number three, native vegetation. I had a question on this the other day. When do you talk about native vegetation management? Why don't you talk about it right now? Well, for one, during the hunting season, August, September, October is not a time, November, early December, to talk about native vegetation management. No one's looking for it, no one's searching it, no one's doing anything. There's not much you can do right now. Uh, Dylan told me about one of the state websites where someone was asking just in the last week, you know, last end of August, asking the, the DNR, what can I do to my land to improve the habitat right now for deer season this year? A little late, folks. You can plant food plots. That'll hold deer um, if you have that open space. But the recommendation was to get rid of honeysuckle and buckthorn. Well, if you went and did that, you'd ruin your hunting season now and maybe for years to come, depending on your complexity with habitat. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to remove invasives, but most of us didn't buy land to remove invasives. We bought land to actually mold and shape a deer herd and have a great hunt and enjoy the land with their family and friends. That's why we bought the land. I've seen people spend decades trying to move buckthorn, for example, and really never getting a full grasp on it. Literally decades. That's what they spent their time doing instead of spending time enjoying the land. And they told me firsthand that's not enjoyable. So don't, don't fool yourself that you go out there, wow, this is a really good project. I feel good about myself. We'll try doing that for 20 years or 10 years. And uh, you might want to just sell that land and buy somewhere else. Native vegetation though, just because you have goldenrod in your field right now, just because you have various forms of forbs and forages growing, just because you have a nice weedy food plot that deer are attracted to during the summertime, doesn't mean you're actually managing deer. It just means you have habitat. And some of that habitat, most of that habitat is dead and brown and done and mature by the time it gets into hunting season. So it's not holding deer, it's not attracting deer. I can show you lots of goldenrod around here, around the, around the farm right here. All that's dead and dried out. It doesn't hold deer, doesn't feed deer, and it doesn't really hold pheasants or rabbits during the summertime or during the wintertime either. So during the holes of habitat, when deer actually die, they either succumb to winter severity or hunting pressure. I know in the UP of Michigan, there was a period of time, I believe it was 15 years, during that period of time, 900,000 deer were killed by hunters and 1.1 million were killed by winter severity over that time period. I think during that time, 140,000 were killed by wolves, 200,000 were killed by wolves, just for comparison. But about 2 million deer died just from winter severity and hunters in the UP of Michigan during that period of time, I think 95 to 2010 would have been the years. So that's the lowest hole in the bucket. Those deer are not dying during the summertime. Again, native vegetation management. If you have native vegetation management, that's great. I encourage you to do that. We do that here. We want especially woody browse. We want pollinator blends planted adjacent to our switch. I like to see a ratio of about three to four to one pollinator blend versus switch, meaning three or four times more switch than pollinator blend because the cover is the lowest hole in the bucket when you get into the winter time. The deer, the deer don't have cover, that great a cover during that time, it's great thermal cover, but especially rabbits and pheasants do not have that cover during the winter time and switchgrass in these, the north half of the country, you get down into Iowa, southern Illinois, southern Indiana, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, then you can get by with native grasses that'll stand straight up because the winters are not that severe. You can get good snow for a short period of time, but it's really not that severe. So switch grasses covers that lowest hole in the bucket when you get further north. And that's, that's critical because after all, if those critters don't have cover, they can't live. At the same time though, when we talk about deer season and deer in the season, if you don't have food plots on your private land, you think you can do it all with native vegetation, you are sorely mistaken and you've been misguided or misled if you followed some advice to the contrary. You have to have quality food. That's what sets the table and creates deer movement every single day. You could have two competing properties, two similar properties, neighborhood properties. One's a thousand acres here, one's a thousand acres here. If the 1,000 acre parcel has food plots and food sources on it and the other one doesn't, if the habitat's equal, great habitat, great 
native vegetation management, guess what? The one without the food plots isn't gonna see very many deer because all the deer are gonna leave that thousand and go over here. There might be a random buck over there, but we're talking random. We're not talking something you can influence that you can actually manage because if it's random, you can't management manage it because you can't define it. You can't say this is going to happen so I can do this or I do this to create this situation. You can't say that if it's random. Food sets the table every day. Those does want to bed close to their afternoon food source. You know, again, they feed five times in a 24 hour period. They want to feed twice in their, in their bedding areas. And it's important to have that browse, native vegetation management during the day. But if you don't have that quality food plot, you're going to lose deer to your neighbors. You're not gonna be managing anything. And that's the sad truth. Because again, if those deer are on your neighbors during the daylight, you're only seeing them after dark randomly, what are you actually managing? Just because you manage habitat doesn't mean you're a deer manager. So when you have these food plots and you have consistent, adequate cover, it doesn't have to be great, it just has to be adequate, then you're going to be able to have an influence over the herd for the entire season, especially in November. Look at how many bucks die opening day of gun season in most of these upper half in, in high hunting pressure states. So many deer just die on opening day. So your food plots, your habitat management, your bedding areas, the travel to and from, they all have to be very secure in the middle of the, the season. And that's why I don't advocate shooting does during the middle of the season, opening day of gun season, unless you already have a buck on the ground. Then you shoot the does, buck's already on the ground, you have to go get them anyways and make that disturbance. But to shoot does on opening days, you're really shooting yourself in the foot of, of gun season and you're actually going against being an actual herd influencer. You're just shooting does at that point. Think of the 70-30 rule. What's that mean? 70% of your time or 80% of your time should be put into food plots, 20, 30% of your time into native vegetation. Because if you're only doing TSI, people say, yeah, I'm doing TSI, it sounds so scientific, timber stand improvement. They're doing that and we have deer. Well, that's great if no one else in the neighborhood is planting food plots, no one else is practicing timber stand improvement, then you might have the deer because you have the best food source. But as soon as someone puts that food plot a mile away, you're not going to be able to influence the herd because they're all going to leave you during the daylight and focus somewhere else. You only get to see them at night and those who see those deer during the night are many. Again, 95% of all properties are greater and they're not influencing a thing except maybe their pocketbook. Because when you get down here to number five, the money that you spend, someone will say, well, I have a $20,000 deer habitat fund, whether it's planting shrubs, getting timber stand improvement, bedding areas cut, planting conifers, trees, hardwoods. The money you spend does never overcomes the fact if you don't have deer during the daylight on your land, and I'm talking the oldest bucks in the neighborhood consistently focusing on your land in and throughout the season, then it doesn't matter how much you spend, you can't overcome that fact if you have a nocturnal parcel. So dollars can't determine that. Think of it this way, are you a deer manager or a habitat manager? I want you to be both because if you're both, you're an actual herd influencer. But the amount of herd influencers are few, very few, and far between. So you can never look at it just because you're spending dollars, just because you're improving your habitat, just because you're working on grasses, planting shrubs, that you're actually managing deer. Did you hear anything with deer in any of that? Even if they're deer plantings, that doesn't mean that you're managing deer. There's a lot of deer managers out there that need to hear this because if they're not managing deer during the daylight, during hunting season, they're not actually deer managers, they're habitat managers, and there's a big difference. There's very few of us out there that actually manage deer, and that's what I want for you. I want you, when you go out to hunt, whether you're on public or private land, I want you to experience the best that the area has to offer because not every area is, is the same. You know, we have great bucks around here, but if I go over into Buffalo County, I know clients over there that are seeing 200 inch animals every single year. That's the same in Western Illinois, portions of Iowa, portions of Kentucky. There's people that literally are seeing 200 inch deer every single year. People say it's this big mythical creature. I was on client properties in Ohio this year where they see 200 inch deer every single year. They've shot multiple 200 inch deer during the last several years. They see them every single year. They see multiple 200 inch deer in the neighborhood. What does that tell you? It just tells you they get to five, six years old and that's what the genetics and the soil create in that area. Nothing special, nothing special about them if they shoot a 200 inch where if someone else that shoots a 140 and they're both the same age class, it's the same thing. But again, it goes back to 
How many deer are you seeing during the daylight? You know, sometimes people need to hear what they're not in order to know what they become. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I want people to know the potential because there's so much more potential than a lot of times people believe or understand that they can actually produce on a small parcel. I want to see you when you shoot a mature buck on your land, another one slots in because your land is so attractive. That's what we see. It can be a 40 acre, 30 acre parcel, small parcel. Again, think about it this way. This is really important. A buck does have a home range on average three miles. And that's during his hunting season range. We're not talking yarding and moving and everything else. But the majority of that's at night. And the majority of that is in random movement areas too, where deer are pushed from this property to that property. There's no good property that has quality food that lasts the entire season and quality browse and native vegetation that's not overpressured in that same on that same property very few properties have those conditions and when they don't then bucks are kicked around they never get to experience that older age class that's because they're moving everywhere again most of that's at night though but they'll get pushed quickly think about it though on quality properties an average buck movement is about two to four hundred yards during the daylight almost the entire season and even half of the rut he's still just moving around his home core area so for seven ten days he might be somewhere else and but even then what i find is that if you have a very highly controlled property where it's an actual herd influencing property he's going to be away from that property a lot less than you may believe and when he's only moving two to four hundred yards during daylight pretty easy to manage him if you create the conditions a food that lasts the entire season quality food of quality cover that's unpressured that covers the three feedings during the daylight two at night send them to your neighbors they're plenty you know, again, 95% of all parcels, no matter how much they work on them, are nocturnal to the bulk of the older age class of the deer herd. Let the deer leave and go feed on those properties. Feed on the surrounding ag all night. Live high in the hog all night, and then they come back to your property and focus on your property during the daylight so that you can truly become a herd influencer. Are you managing habitat? Just because you're managing habitat doesn't mean you're a deer manager. Are you truly managing deer? And if your answer is yes, then that means you have the focus, consistent focus of daylight bucks on your land during the hunting season. And for that, you're not only a deer manager, you're a herd influencer for the entire neighborhood. Because what I find is it only takes one parcel out of 10 one parcel out of 20 to dictate what goes on in the entire neighborhood, good or bad. So look at it this way. If you have a lot of food plots, you have great habitat, you're attracting a huge amount of deer on and off your parcel, and you just go in and spook them. Now you're educating more deer in the neighborhood, but you're not only educating deer, you're pushing deer across boundaries, back and forth, across roads. You increase car deer road collisions you increase predation because deer are putting more miles on and certainly by going over boundaries you put deer in the front of more tree stands and blind locations in front of hunters that may not have the same goals that you do and that's fine if they don't have those same goals there's nothing wrong with that but you have to understand that going in that if you're attracting pulling pushing deer on and off your parcel because of a poor property layout because you're not you're managing more habitat than deer then you're going to have a negative effect on the deer herd in the neighborhood and there's a lot of people that pat themselves on the back because they do great jobs managing habitat but they don't actually manage deer and i don't want you to confuse the two that you're thinking you're a deer manager if you're one of those many that really see the bulk of those bucks during nocturnal hours as opposed to daylight during the hunting season this fall and beyond you need to ask yourself are you truly a herd influencer and i hope the answer is yes and i hope the answer can be found in all these videos you try to put out because that's the number one goal of this channel hey guys i really appreciate you watching today's video and we're out here having some fun today we're planting some switchgrass cutting some timber making some bedding areas but most importantly we're putting it all together and that's critical any habitat improvements that you're making you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot you have to link those together so that helps your hunt this fall really i encourage you to check out my web classes the link is in the description it's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now